Good morning, Kansas City. Thanks for coming out. Great to have you here. Uh, my name is Brian. I'm one of your community organizers. I'm here with Britton and Milton. And over here, I've got Toby. Raise your hand, Toby. Okay, thank you. I, Toby's dressed like a bartender. I don't know if you guys know that. Um, or maybe bartenders are dressed like business people now. I'm not sure what's going on. I always give them trouble about that. Um, Kaufman, uh, pardon me, One Million Cups is a weekly entrepreneurial educational event brought to you by the Kaufman Foundation. And um, every week we bring two entrepreneurs up and they share their story with us and then we do some Q&A. And before we get it started, I'd like to uh, say hello to my, our, our panel. Um, we've got Jeff and Ben. You guys, uh, is the mic on over there? Find it? Okay. So we're going to start off the questioning with these two guys. It's on. Introduce yourselves, please. Uh, Jeff Shackleford. I run a program here called Digital Sandbox KC, a proof of concept program to help early stage entrepreneurs move from idea to working concept to get in business to create jobs, all in less than six seconds. Hello, I'm Ben Cottrell. I own a business called DoodleKit. DoodleKit is a website builder for small businesses. I'm also a technology advisor for a few local startups, and I am also a scale-up ambassador. Um, scale-up is a business education program for growth stage businesses. So if you're a growth stage business and you want some free education, come talk to me and I'll tell you all about it. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, who's here for the first time? Raise your hand. Thank you for coming. And who, who hasn't been here for a while? I know I've talked to a few people that it's been a while since they, they've been here. So thank you for coming back. Great to see you. Um, all right, let's get things rolling. We've got Ryan Weber from KC Next to introduce us to shoot. Here we go. Let's hear it for Ryan. Okay. I'm excited to talk to everybody today about a new product that we have launched uh, outside of KC Next. Has anyone heard of KC Next real quick by a raise of hands? Good, good. If you have it, we serve as the technology council here in Kansas City. Uh, we're essentially a startup trade association. So we started this just a handful of years ago with a few member companies that helped fund our organization. It's grown tremendously over that time. And now we're over 100 member companies. And that's big companies like Sprint, Cerner, Garmin, Google, Microsoft, and a lot of small to medium-sized firms. And we do three main things, but our goal is to, to basically promote and grow the technology sector in Kansas City. And we have a board of directors, like every nonprofit does. And on our board, you'll see a list of folks that are C-level executives and CTOs from big companies and small companies. And every year, we ask them for advice. And at the beginning of every year, we have a retreat, and we ask them, what are the major issues facing the industry? And this year, the tune was completely different. All the group collectively and uh, very encouragingly said that as an organization, we have to focus on workforce. There is a growing gap between the workers that are needed and the workers that are available and the skills that are needed for these positions. And to be honest, Caitlin and I, when we had, went to this retreat, we, uh, we were a little overwhelmed by that. This is a very big problem. Let me show you how big it is. By 2020, app development jobs, these aren't mobile apps, these are just computer apps, will grow by about 28%. That's huge when you compare it to other industries. In fact, in the same study, 65% of the leaders that were interviewed said that that shortage was having a negative impact on their business and that recruiting and retention was the number one issue facing their industry. And job postings, so companies that are looking for positions grow by over 11%, which if you were to compare that to other industries like manufacturing or other big subsectors, it's a huge increase. Technology as an industry is the second largest industry in the country. It's bigger than the automotive industry and it's second only to healthcare. And by 2020, there will be 400,000 people for 1.4 million tech jobs. So if you don't know how to write code, this should say job security for you. It's a huge problem. And in Kansas City, we're not unlike any other city, but we're in a war for young talent, that young technology talent. 
Every city in America is figuring out how to attract that talent to their city because they know what I know. There's a huge shortage and a big demand coming. We have a perception problem in Kansas City, and when we were out visiting with our employers, HR executives, we learned that that perception problem specifically was, was wrapped around external candidates, that when they were offered a job at a company in Kansas City, the number one reason why they said no was that they believed there were no other jobs in Kansas City. That's ridiculous. In fact, there are over 2,000 open technology jobs today, and there are over 600 companies hiring for those positions. We just never told them about the companies and the jobs that are in Kansas City. So a couple of months ago, we really wrapped our mind around how can we solve this problem. And ironically, we came to a pretty clear solution. Technology can help us solve this problem. So we partnered with Black Ops Development. We've been working very closely with Milton over the past almost six months now building this product. And before we even wrote one line of code, we met with key focus group of HR executives and recruiters from the companies you see above. And I know those are all big companies, but they make the world move. They are the attractors of the, the significant number of tech talent to our region. And so we asked them, if we were to build a product that could help solve this problem, what functionality would you need? So over the course of several months and meeting with these folks and, and learning a lot, by the way, way more than I ever want to know about how people are recruited and hired. And as you know, in a lot of these big companies too, you have to go through an application process, you have to create an account, and it's turned into more of a deselection process than a selection process because they are overwhelmed with candidates from all across the globe. So, I'm excited to introduce to you today, some of you for the first time, Shoot, a brand and a product that we hope can help solve the attraction problem for technology talent into Kansas City. As you see, we're gonna have a lot of fun with this. Um, it's, a, it's a product, if you think of like a parachute being that safe landing, and we want everyone to feel like that in Kansas City it's a safe landing for your next job. Because by the way, we're asking people to move, and we're asking them to come to Kansas City from a different place. And that can be very intimidating for folks. So you can go check the website out now. It's live, it's working, shootkc.com, powered by KC Next. It's very much part of our organization and tied to our organization. But we branded this as a separate thing. You'll notice in Kansas City, whenever we have a new initiative, it's KC something, and we're guilty of it. We've probably created a number of them. But the external talent, that's not necessarily what they need. What you'll see with this name is it really does reflect some of the similar branding of other tech job boards. And we wanted to be mentioned in the same breath as those. So I'll give you a quick little preview here. When you first thing you do, or first thing you'll see when you go to the website is Kansas City. We know that young people specifically pick a city before they pick a job. And they pick a city based on a number of things, but we actually have a lot to offer in that regard. We have tons of cultural and lifestyle amenities that attract those people in. Next thing they do is they pick a job, or they pick a company, I'm sorry. And they pick a company based on culture, office, location, and that information, believe it or not, can be pretty hard to find. So we allow our users to create company profiles, which they can showcase graphically what it's like to work at those companies. I'll show you an example of DST. DST is a large tech employer in town focused in the financial industry. They're very proud of being in Kansas City, and this is their page. This is what they created. On the job side, when a candidate goes to apply, it sends them directly to the posting at the corporate website, not through our site, directly to the company. And it sends that recruiter a notification that the person has applied for the job. So today, Within a week or so that we launched this thing, about a week and a half now, there's already almost 150 now. This has increased just in the last day. Uh, 40 companies and a ton of users. When we were promoting this online, there's a key stat there I'll show in that of our online footprint and getting the word out about this, over 54% were not Kansas City that were following this, which is great for us. We are really focused this specifically as an external attraction tool. We didn't want to create this so it would be easier for somebody working at Cerner to work at Sprint. That is not our goal. We look at somebody in Kansas City as already being here. We really want to focus this on attraction. So I believe I'm running out of time, but uh, right now we're focused on getting the word out locally. We need to put as many jobs on this as possible so that when we go and promote this externally, it is pre-populated. So we have been working as, and doing as many public speaking things as we can to get the word out to employers and any company that's hiring tech talent to use our site. And we'll be at Tech Week. We already were at Tech Week Kansas City promoting jobs in Kansas City to all the students that were here from across the region. 
but we're also going to New York and we're going to LA and we have no idea what it's gonna be like to uh, recruit from those areas, but I guarantee you we're gonna find people that's either from Kansas City, has a connection to Kansas City, or wants to get the hell out of New York City, and that's what we wanna be able to provide for them. So, here's my contact information. I encourage you to go check it out. There's plenty of jobs on there today, but also if you're an employer or work for someone looking for tech talent, we wanna be the solution for you. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ryan. All right, let's, uh, let's open it up to questions, Jeff. Great, so Ryan, terrific. You and I have had this conversation. We do not have enough tech talent here, so anything we can do to bring more in is terrific. So I saw you know, a lot of uh, great, large Kansas City corporations. Um, so I'd like to get a handle more on how does a smaller, mid-sized company who has the same challenges, and kind of part one, part two, sure. What's the cost, or I mean, how, how would they? How does that hit their bottom line? Sure. And by the way, I want to introduce Caitlin Miley. So this is the Casey Next team. <laughs> we are a small but mighty team. Caitlin is was very involved in this project, so I want to make sure that if I miss anything, she's she can help absolutely help me out on that. So answer your question. So on our site, big companies are directly next to small companies. So a Cerner and a startup are listed directly next to each other. Um, Cerner does need startups, believe it or not. Startups are sexy and cool, and you are, they're an attraction tool to the region. They very much are. So this product allows any company, it's affordable, to post on there directly with a Cerner or a Garmin. So your, your post is right alongside theirs. Can you define affordable? I mean, that, that's different yeah. for Cerner than it is for the two-man shop getting started. Yeah, and by the way, if you've ever tried to go apply on many of these different job sites, they're very expensive. So it's unaffordable for most young companies, even small businesses, they just, don't, they just don't do it. So they rely on their personal network and their website and social media to get the word out of open jobs. But if you're a member company of KC Next, so if your company is a member of ours, it's only 200 bucks to post a job for 30 days. If you're a non-member, it's a little bit higher and it's 399. But that doesn't mean that that's where it ends. We would love to create an option that makes sense for startups, so in fact, I want to throw it back out to this crowd specifically to let us know. I mean, there's a reason why my, our email and our contact information is up there. We want to know what is a, an affordable way because we want to create and really encourage a way to create startups and very small companies the option to post because you have the same problem as the big companies do. So um, is there a particular demographic that you're focusing on other than developer? Are you looking for people from small towns, from other big cities, and then also how is it that you plan on a track? I mean, I'm, Im imagining that there are people in, you know, Omaha and Austin and, and all the other cities thinking the same thing and maybe even working on similar things trying to build people from Kansas City. So how, how is it that you're really planning on attracting people and pulling them in? Yeah, so we looked at some migration data, which is fascinating. Because we hear rumors that people, you know, we're, we're losing people to the coast. We are not. As a region, we lose people to three areas of this country, Dallas, Phoenix, and Florida. We take more people than we lose to the coasts, and there's one city that we almost every year give about 10,000 or so people back and forth, and that's Minneapolis. So when you hear these rumors, they're just not true. We do not lose people to the coast. Now, we may lose a good developer, and we think there's a trend. There's not a trend. It's not happening. That being said, <laughs> That doesn't necessarily mean that's where we're gonna focus because we feel like we can win the Midwest. We don't know that we can compete with a New York City or Los Angeles, but we're gonna go and we're gonna learn and we're gonna try. And I guarantee you, like I said, we're gonna find somebody who has a connection to Kansas City there. And it'll be worth the trip. But we know that we can win the Midwest. We can absolutely compete with Omaha, St. Louis, Oklahoma City, Denver. We can compete with these places and we should. We won't become we're competitive as a region in attracting that talent, we lose the war. And I don't, I can't really imagine what this city would look like without the tech footprint than it does today. You no, know, we can, I'll just add on to that uh, real quick. Uh, 
we can learn a lot from this platform. So one thing we didn't really have time to mention is the data back end of this product. Um, we'll know a lot of real time data about the trends in hiring in Kansas City, what types of skills and what levels of experience companies in Kansas City are looking for. And based on that knowledge, we know where those eyeballs are across the nation. So if we're all looking for middle experience, certain type of developers, we can go find them and target them in a number of different ways. The list goes on and on. Um, conferences, social media, uh, campus visits, alumni groups, a lot of um, opportunities like that in marketing. One, one more quick question. Um, you said you work with comp the companies. Have you worked with developers to try to figure out what it is that it attracts them? Because they're, they're a really weird breed. I speak from personal experience. <laughs> yes. Uh, Candidates, we, we're constantly learning more and more about how candidates find jobs. But we do know, based on the data and research that we've conducted with our partners at KCADC and Team KC and other uh, groups that have been working specifically on this problem, that those three things I mentioned, talented people pick cities first, so we've got to promote Kansas City as a destination for this kind of person. They pick a company, again, based on the things I mentioned, culture, lifestyle, office space. Is it a loft space? Is it a cube space? Is it downtown? Is it an Overland Park? And so, again, that information was pretty hard to find. You'd have to do a lot of your own individual searches. Well, that's not the case now. And if I go back to show you, um, like on DST, for example, you know that DST is located downtown. You could plug in their social media feeds. It's, the bare bones is just right there. And by the way, this is version one. <laughs> uh, very much taking a lean approach to this. This is our MVP. So we are learning constantly how our employers are using this, and we've learned, we've learned a lot already since it's been out in the public eye for about a week and a half. So it's gonna evolve, and that's the only way we know how to do it. We can't just throw something out there and expect people to use it. Okay, let's break it open to the, to the audience here. We've got a first question in the middle. Thank you very much. Ryan, thank you so much for coming here. Congratulations on the social media stats. Those are impressive. Thank I you. would love to hear where you guys are going to go evolve forward your marketing with social media. Where are you? <laughs> sure. Um, there's a number of things we can do. So as you as you see, we have both a Casey Next Twitter handle and a shoot. Twitter handle. So we'll be um, targeting in-market and out-of-market very differently. So we see the out-of-market audience as being the job seekers, those who maybe have a misperception about Kansas City or those who have no perception about Kansas City, might know a little bit, need to know more. So we'll be doing a lot of promotion of Kansas City's lifestyle assets, uh, the companies who are using Shoot and the unique things about them that we're learning from their use of the platform. Um, and then in-market really uh, through KC Next, showcasing Shoot as a tool. So again, some of those statistics about how candidates are using it, um, how companies are hiring with it, some of the statistics about hiring trends in our region, and anything that we can equip both companies and educators in our region to make them work smarter, not harder. So this real-time data is gonna be a huge um, value to add to our in-market audience, and then outside the market, we're gonna hit it hard in really promoting Kansas City and the tech community here. Have a question up front? Yeah. Good morning, great presentation. Um, from someone who's moved down from Minneapolis a few years ago, the winters are slightly more enjoyable here. The question is, um, this looks great. You've got a lot of great uh, solid data behind you, which is very impressive. How do you consider that you differentiate yourself from a job board or a glass door that, you know, that talks about culture as well as uh, just the job listings themselves? Focused, so this is just technology jobs in Kansas City. Anything outside will be removed. And any, that doesn't mean that remote people can't work here for those companies, but they need to be employed in Kansas City. And that's a key. So you can go look at Monster and Indeed and you can search technology jobs in Kansas City and what you'll probably find is that it's technology employers not looking to hire you in Kansas City, looking to move you from Kansas City. So you'll see jobs from IBM, GE, and all these other big tech employers, but not in Kansas City. It's a huge problem. Got a question to your right. Hey. Hey. Um, I was wondering, well, you already talked about this being the beta. So what type of features are you testing, are you planning on potentially adding on in the future? And big question, do you plan on making it responsive so people can use it on their mobile phones? Yeah. Uh, so you've already noticed that. <laughs> um, Again, we're making data-driven decisions. Our traffic right now is almost specifically desktop. So until that shifts, I don't think we need to invest our limited resources into a mobile site. But 
yes, that's coming in the future, it has to. It just has to. Anyone that's developing a web presence, you've gotta have a mobile presence too. When, I, I don't know. I will say that uh, we've already gotten feedback from recruiters saying, you know, why are you building this? It's gonna affect our business. It is not. We are focused on net new talent to the region, which helps that group of people move people around, to be honest with you, that's how the world works. And you know, that's, uh, that's something that we'll have to think about too. And for candidates to be able to raise their hand and say, I'm looking for a job in Kansas City, I'm willing to work with a recruiter. There's an opportunity there too, because typically recruiters have a pulse on companies that are hiring rapidly or hiring or specifically looking to relocate folks or have the resources to relocate talent. So that's all things that we've thought out. There's, there's no timeline there. Uh, we don't know. I mean, we've gotta see how this first version um, is utilized and if it'll be successful. We've already had paying customers and we're very excited about that, but uh, on that too, because it's always a tricky subject when we talk about money and things like that, but the resources that we generate from this go directly back into solving this problem. We're a nonprofit. We don't have shareholders. We can't distribute dividends. All that's not possible. If this makes money, it goes directly back to solving this workforce problem. So big difference too between the Indeeds and Monsters and others. We're focused on solving this problem for Kansas City. We don't care about anybody else. Got a question to your right in the back. Good morning. You asked to hear about the affordability from the crowd. So my question would be, you know, I'm a tech guy. I actually got my first job off of Craigslist. I've posted several ads on Craigslist and hired people from Craigslist, $25. Yeah. So as a startup, what would be the benefit for myself to join this rather than do something there? Well, our goal is that you're gonna get a lot more eyeballs of people that have the kind of skills that you're looking for because we're promoting this every day just to technology folks. Craigslist is not. So even though, you, I mean, honestly, that's great. That's a really affordable tool to find talent. But I hope that you'll find that the quality and access to talent here in Kansas City will go up by using our site. But yeah, but as far as cost and things like that, I appreciate knowing, I mean, I had no idea that Craigslist charged $25. That was not a, that was not part of our comparison group. So thank you. I have a question on your left over here. Um, just, to, can you speak a little bit to the, you've said that you're doing, um, you know, research and outside of the city or promoting this outside of Kansas City. Can you talk a little bit, some of the specifics of what you're doing? From a research standpoint outside Kansas City? Uh, sorry, skip the research <laughs> part and the, just the promotion part in terms of you're promoting this, you're, you're trying to get eyeballs outside of Kansas City to find this. Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned uh, to the social, social media question, there's a lot we can do to uh, target eyeballs outside of Kansas City without even leaving Kansas City. But we are also going to be leaving Kansas City and taking this on the road. So we're launching our official national public launch will be during Tech Week New York during their hiring fair. Uh, I guess next month, today's the last day of September, so next month still. Um, we'll be going to Tech Week LA and other similar conferences that draw large numbers of external uh, tech professionals from across the nation. We'll also be doing a lot of targeted social media and digital media campaigns, um, reaching out to select universities, alumni groups, special student interest groups, professional groups, meetup groups, all kinds, you know, all the things you could think of, um, doing a lot of outreach and seeing how we can collaborate with those groups across the nation. Yeah, the great thing about this audience is we know where they are. We know where their eyeballs view, we, we know exactly how to find them, and, and we plan on working with the experts in this region that know how to attract audiences. And we're lucky to have access to those companies. Um, we have a lot of great advertising, social media, media experts here in Kansas City, and we'll, we'll definitely be leveraging that. You got one? Yeah, I have one, a question in the middle in the back. Yes, um, I don't see anything on Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Kansas City, every Chamber of Commerce is very proud of their city. They would get real estate people involved, uh, come to our city, live in our city, work in our city. So wait, what's, so are we working with the Chamber or? Yeah, we, we're, we're members and we have a direct partnership with them and have worked with them on a number of things. They're, part of their initiative specifically focus on this attraction of, of the workforce. And so yeah, we're absolutely in communication involved with the Chamber. Mm -hmm. Another one in the middle here. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Um, two quick questions. One, how did you come up with the pricing? And then second, 
If your goal is to try to promote as many different companies in Kansas City as possible, putting any kind of price barrier for small companies or mid-sized companies might be counterproductive to that goal. Well, these things cost money. We made a huge investment in this, and we've, we've got to get it back. Otherwise, we're toast. <laughs> so we have to charge. There's no, there's no way around it. We just don't have the ability to charge for ads or things like that to make the gener generate the revenue we would need. To be honest, how we came up with these numbers is we looked at what it would cost for you to post to these other job boards and split it in half. So it's half the cost of another job board. But as Ryan mentioned, you know, we are in an MVP stage. And so a group like this, the reason we are so excited about presenting to One Million Cups is we're still learning a lot. And so again, if there are ideas you have or, um, you know, if the pricing is a barrier to use for small to mid-sized companies, early stage companies, we'd love to hear that feedback. And as we continue rolling out later phases, you know, we want to implement that direct feedback. Yes. Got a question here in the front also? Yeah. Ryan, this is a, a challenging problem, and I think your focus is um, going to work, right? But it's a multifaceted problem once they get here, right? So are you, are you partnering with, like, LiveKC or anybody like that who are trying to make Kansas City kind of the center of gravity for millennials once they do get here? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. So how we work within this whole ecosystem of, of talent and making Kansas City cool, we are the extra voice, and we have been for a long time. Our parent company, the KCADC, is the group that's attracting new companies, new firms to Kansas City. We're using that same strategy to attract people. And when they're here, we plug them into things like LiveKC, GenKC, and the other programs here. We look at those programs as retention tools because it makes Kansas City very sticky. And that makes it for them when they get a job or an opportunity in a different city to leave. And that's a, that's a big part of it. But we are really focused on attraction because that's a much harder game than retention right now. Kansas City has had more momentum with our cultural renaissance since 2007, and we're benefiting tremendously from that. And that's a big bonus for us, to, for timing-wise, to consider an opportunity like this, because even though we're experiencing here, we haven't that. I have a quick question here in the middle. So my question is, uh, you know, I love what you guys are doing here. My question is, you know, we're going to have this same competition coming from other cities. So what are we doing to, to get ahead of what they're currently doing? And then are you guys thinking, like, once they see these, like, this type of product roll out, what their reaction might be and how they might combat that? Because obviously that's the real, I mean, that's kind of the real competition here is making sure that we're staying ahead of those cities. Oh yeah, we're not claiming victory by any means. In fact, I was in New York City last week and met with uh, my counterpart, my, my peer that runs the New York Technology Council, and he wants to license this. And my answer was, no way. <laughs> no way, I mean, this is our thing. We're not, we don't have any strategy or any plan to move this to a different industry or a different city. That's not part of our strategy with this. That does not mean that they can't invest the same money we did to build something very similar. And I expect them to, but we're first. And we're the only city right now uh, focused on something like this. Now, there are job boards out there, too. But from geographic, industry-specific standpoint and a nonprofit tech association running it, that's unique so far. That will change. Yeah, I'm and sure. competition is a beautiful thing. So hopefully, if we continue making data-driven decisions, continue working with the awesome groups around town like LiveKC, like KCADC, like the Chambers, who are doing this work every day and continue that collaborative effort to just elevate Kansas City and what makes it great to work here and live here um, and work specifically in technology. Um, I think as long as we stay true to that authentic mission, I think that you know we can accomplish what we want to accomplish. Like Brian said, we're constantly giving and taking talent from a number of different markets. And if we can move that needle, then that's awesome and bring more net new to Kansas City. Um, so we'll continue just kind of learning as much as we can, collaborating with the groups who make sense, and um, adding features and functionality that will hopefully continue sustaining this thing um, for years to come. But please do email us. I know we're out of time, but please do send me an email, call me. Um, let us know if you have any feedback or ideas on this, because we will listen. So thank you very much. Ryan, Caitlin, thank you so much for coming and presenting today. By the way, you guys should really be thanking Milton. He's been uh, a big part of this project. It was a lot of fun and very exciting to work with you guys on it. Um, again, great presentation. Thank you. Um, so let's see a show of hands for anyone that's been to One Million Cups more than 10 times. Let's raise those hands high. We want to see those. All right. 
So what we'd like to do at this point, um, just as a way to say thank you for those of you that uh, come out and support us, we select one person uh, for the Mug Club. Brian is moving about uh, with a mic, and I think he's found someone. Thank you so much for raising your hands, though. Testing. Okay. Introduce yourself, sir. Uh, hi, my name is Chris Cardinal. I need to do more. I am a... Uh, that's too much information. Previous One Million Cups presenter, I uh, run a company called well to do We make digital therapeutics here in Kansas City. Great to see you here, as always. And I don't know if you guys know this, but this wall does need holding up every Wednesday morning. Chris is there to help us do that. Uh, speaking of uh, previous presenters, uh, we are also um, always looking for more presenters. So if you would like to present at One Million Cups, please visit the website, uh, hit the apply button. It'll, it'll ask you a few questions, send us your info, or if you know of another uh, entrepreneur, another startup company looking to present at One Million Cups, uh, we'd love to review their application, get in contact with them. As you may or may not know, this is streamed live on the internet every Wednesday morning. Um, so it's not just a crowd that's here. We have other uh, remote locations that watch and people all around the world that are watching as well. So before I bring up our uh, next presenter, uh, from KC Natural, Brendan O'Neill, who's here to talk about how KC Natural creates unique barbecue sauces uh, for people who suffer from food uh, sensitivities. Let's welcome Brendan. Thanks, man. All right. Am I on? Okay, yeah, I am, definitely. Uh, okay, it's too bad more of you didn't sit up front. That's where I hid the barbecue sauce. Um, but you can reach forward and steal it. So uh, I want to tell you about Casey Natural. This is my first presentation, and uh, I'll just go right out and say sometimes I'm a little awkward when I'm nervous, so we'll see how this goes. Um, so I started Casey Natural uh, a few years ago when I realized uh, I was having a lot of health problems that uh, were because of food allergies. I was sick all the time. I was about 50 pounds heavier. I felt horrible. And then I realized how connected food is to how I felt um, and, and how healthy we all, we all are, or unhealthy for that matter. Um, and so the more I learned about what I was putting in my body, the more I learned about autoimmune diseases, which affect one in five Americans. Um, you have probably all met people who eat gluten-free or can't have this or can't have that. If you're the one organizing the office party, you probably get frustrated. Um, I became one of those people. And so um, I started realizing how unhealthy the barbecue sauces I loved are. Uh, that's the two uh, foot of snow that I dug the path through to uh, get to my grill. Um, I've always loved barbecue. Um, and then I've always loved to cook as well. And so as I started looking more at what I was putting in my body, the more I realized unhealthy the things I was putting in my body actually were. So I finally kind of hit me as I was making a lot of sauce recipes in my own kitchen that this is the one way in Kansas City of all places I could make, um, I could do something I love and actually do something that's a little bit different even in a space as crowded as barbecue sauce. I mean, because that's just what we need, right? Another barbecue sauce company in Kansas City. So, um, but the main ingredients of Casey Natural, these are sort of our brand values that I've come to sort of embrace and, and see is, you know, what, what really makes me passionate about uh, the, this company uh, that started my kitchen is that, you know, I write recipes that just use ingredients you probably have in your own kitchen. I don't consult a scientist or anything like that. I just write recipes I like. I take it a mile from my house. Another great thing about living in Kansas City, there's a barbecue manufacturer a mile from everyone's house. And um, I'm also, I also believe that we should be locally minded and approachable. I hate to even say this, but if you call the number on the bottle, it routes to my cell phone and I'll answer. And, um, <laughs> I've had people call me on a Saturday morning when I'm playing with my daughter and ask me about ingredients, and I'm always happy to talk. Um, and I also think that our products, and this is probably the biggest thing, is that we have an inclusive product line and company philosophy. We want to not only offer the best barbecue sauces and unique blends, but we also want to be available to people, to, to everyone, no matter what they, what they you know, choose to eat or what kind of lifestyle they live. And um, I also think that, you know, as far as our branding is concerned, I wanted to do something fun because um, if I'm not enjoying the creative, I'm not going to have fun. So 
I think we created a, a brand that is, you know, kind of has this fun vintage vibe with, you know, modern sensibilities. Uh, but it is kind of, to me, it's sort of a cool throwback to a time when, um, you know, people, they, they didn't have a bunch of artificial things to put in their foods. They just cooked with what they had, you know, what they could get at the grocery store. And, and so that's, that's really sort of the core of our, of our company. And, and so is really serving people who uh, have food allergies and can't have, you know, they have really restricted diets. So I'm going to talk to you about our new blends um, that I'm really excited about. These just came out a couple, couple weeks ago. I picked them up. And uh, the first one is the first to market paleo autoimmune protocol barbecue sauce. And for most of you or all of you who may have never heard of the paleo AIP diet, it's one that excludes nightshades, which are tomatoes and uh, spices derived from peppers. So if you can imagine trying to make a tomato-free barbecue sauce that doesn't use chili powder, paprika, black pepper, white pepper. Someone approached us at a food show a couple years ago and joked. She, she said, do you have a tomato-free sauce? I can't have tomatoes or nightshades. And I thought she was joking. And I, but then, that, then it hit me, well, that's our next challenge. That's, if these are the, the folks that we want to serve, then we, we have to, this is what we do. And if no other barbecue sauce company is going to do it, then we're going to do it. So um, I, she, I found out, we met her in Chicago. I found out she actually lives in um, Kansas City. So I was happy to bring her a case of sauce a few weeks ago, and I thought she was going to cry. Um, and then this is our spicy sauce. We always get people that say, do you have a spicy sauce? So I created this all-natural um, sriracha-infused barbecue sauce that's actually mixed with our backyard blend, which is our KC-style sauce. And um, we're currently in about 50 KC area stores, not the new sauces. We have an original sauce, and we're rolling in the new sauces as we speak. Um, and where do we go from here? Well, we want to keep focusing on health-focused uh, health grocery chain, chains like Whole Foods, uh, natural grocers, pl places like that, and move to more of a national you know, scale to a national level. Uh, I also think it would be cool to have a barbecue pla Q place I could actually eat at and other people can actually eat at without worrying about cross-contamination and things like that. And I also think that there's more interesting ways you can cook barbecue than um, you know, what you typically see, even though I love you know, ribs and burn ends and things like that too. I think we could, we could do something different. Uh, we work a lot of food shows and wellness events whenever we can uh, because we want to connect with the people uh, who need us the most. They're the ones who shape our brands, uh, our, our sauces. Uh, for instance, we don't use distilled vinegar anymore. We just use apple cider vinegar in our recipes because we've heard feedback because it, you know, that's often derived from corn or wheat that it can, it can mess with people who have celiac disease. So we thought, well, we're just going to use apple cider vinegar for now on and not even mess with the distilled. So it's those little ways that we, you know, we get that interaction and we talk to people and that's how we know we are serving the people we really want to help. And I think a lot of large companies don't do that, and they should do it more. Um, and so that's why I, I think that that's something we're always going to have to do as we grow no matter what. So um, I think, wow, I thought I had about 15 or 20 minutes to talk, and I was all nervous I wasn't going to get it done. And I did. All right. So I guess that's... Brendan, thank you. We want to go ahead and uh, open it up to our panelists to begin. All right, cool. Brendan, terrific, amazing what you've pulled off. So can you walk us through how a guy in this kitchen is working on some recipes for barbecue sauce to now it's bottled, shipped in several stores? Did you use things like the Innovation Center in Independence, which has a commercial kitchen available for entrepreneurs? I mean, how do you get from... Right. And my other question is, no, F, no FDA approvals or anything you have to jump through to put Oh, yeah, we navigated all that. In fact, um, I was working a job in advertising when I um, started doing KC Natural, and um, I, I just started making phone calls. Uh, my former boss is here, so I don't want to say this, but I probably spent about three hours of my day um, <laughs> hiding in coaching rooms and uh, conference rooms and things like that, making phone calls to try to figure this stuff out. Uh, and so that's when I called Original Juan Specialty Foods. They're down on the boulevard. And uh, they, I, I can't say enough about Original Juan as a manufacturer and co-packer. I literally would bring them the recipes for, you know, from my kitchen and say, you know, this is what we're doing. We go into the test kitchen. 
They file the paperwork for the nutritional info and all that. It goes to K-State. K-State's great too. They have, if you want to get into the food business and you want to get nutritionals, you contact them. They will speak to you directly. They're responsive. So I got a lot of help. Uh, original one, they really kind of hold your hand through the, that process because I'd never you know, done this before. So I just, you know, you just figure things out. And I think that's how a lot of entrepreneurs work. You know, if you have a problem, you just figure it out. There's a solution. And um, if you believe you can do it, you do. So did you come up with the branding since you have that? Kind yeah, of the like, branded... yeah. Um, so I, I use several designers. And so I'm kind of the one who creates sort of the, the overall creative direction. And then I work with very talented people who then execute it better than I even had in my head. And um, then I take the design work to a guy on, uh, again, down on Southwest Boulevard, and he sort of, you know, melds it all together so that it is kind of cohesive and all that. And, and so I, I, that, I get most excited about the branding, I think. And then was it the connection with Wands that got you into the stores, or did um, you knock on those doors? Well, and I knocked on those doors. I had a good friend of mine, Jason. He, uh, he, I've known him you know, for decades, and he would drive around with me, and you know, he would barbecue with me and stuff. And we would go, we would just walk up to hy vs and just you know, talk to the health market manager and, or, and things like that. And when they saw the products, it was just kind of amazing how they would just say, yeah, bring in a case. I, Hy-Vee's great like that too. I mean, they just, you know, they would welcome the local products and then, you know, brought in bottles to Whole Foods and all the grocery buyers at Whole Foods. Oh yeah, we love that. That's cool. And then we would just go through the paperwork and suddenly we would get a purchase order. And so I thought it was, I thought it was going to be trickier. It was almost, I almost got suspicious sometimes at how easy it was. I thought, wait, what's, you know, what, what's going on here? So. So, so if Whole Foods said today, Love it. We want it in all our stores across the nation. Can you ramp this thing up to scale? And yeah, of course. Yeah, Original One is already guaranteed that no matter how much I need to scale, we can do it. For sure. Uh, this is slam dunk to me. I mean, it's great presentation, great positioning, great uh, marketing, everything. Um, I, I'm curious, um, have have you looked into selling this online? I looked at your website. It looks like you kind of redirect to some other sites to do that. Have you looked into that? Yeah, that's something I, I really want to do. Uh, national distribution to retail stores as well as focusing on uh, online channels as well, I think is, is just kind of a, I mean, it's a no-brainer for us, right. especially with all the, you know, especially with like the, the paleo, market or the gluten-free market, there's all these specialized grocers and retail outlets online that specialize in these food products. So I think we could definitely take advantage of those opportunities. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, getting, getting there as a small business and, you know. One, one of the things that popped into my head last week, there was a vinyl record of the month t-shirt club. You could do a barbecue subscription where maybe you know, every month you get barbecue and maybe do experimental things like Boulevard does with their tasting room and things like that. Yeah, you know, I've actually thought, I, I hate to say like, oh, I've thought about that. But really, that's, uh, uh, no, that's a great idea. And I think it would be cool to even just do a, a KC Natural Monthly box that also includes other local Kansas City products too that, you know, just reach out to local companies. Hey, you know, you want to throw your your local vegan bar or your, you know, or your Boulevard t-shirt in our box this month, just as some extra stuff, as well as doing additional unique sauces, I think would be great, uh, especially with a place like Original One where we can just walk in and, you know, get it done and, and sort of streamline it really quickly that way. I think that'd be a great idea. All right, we also want to open this up uh, to the audience for, for questions. Um, if I can ask a, a quick question myself, I'm, I'm curious, it seems like you are really like poised for growth right now. Like it seems like maybe scale is your next step. You're, you're in grocery stores, it looks like you've got great relationships with like Original One. Um, if you were to go like take your next step, right, to another big grocery chain or something like that, who, who would be ideal for you? What, what would be your expectation or, or what would be that thing that you're looking for the most? Right. Well, I think that for us, it's going to be the Whole Foods, the natural grocers, the Sprouts. It's really the health-focused stores that I think are driving the, the grocery trends right now. Like you see that, 
Target and Kroger and uh, Walmart even, they're, they're starting to move the big box, the processed stuff out from the middle and they're starting to move the healthier products in. So I think it's really focusing on the places where our customers shop and on a national level. And I think that we can show that there are all these, these areas that are more heavily populated where it does make financial sense to have the only paleo AIP barbecue sauce that's even available on the market. So I think that's our good kind of like wedge into. So a real quick follow-up question. Sure. How, how do you uh, get these chains to go from saying, hey, I want like one case to like a whole truckload? Do you know how do you how do you um, take that step and really I, push it forward? You know, I think it's it's really just getting in front of the right people and showing them the products because I think the products pretty much sell themselves. Um, because and so I think it's really just getting getting the foot in the right doors and things like that, you know, and just really just pitching it. Um, that's I mean that's in, unless there are better ideas, believe me, I'll take them. Um, so. On your left here. Nervous, awkward, I'm not seeing it. Okay. Fantastic oh, presentation. Thanks. I've seen nervous and awkward up there, and you're okay. not it. Well, just wait. Well, <laughs> all right, the surprise is at the end. That's right. Um, so I'm curious to know the market numbers. Uh, I mean, you said it during your presentation, who needs, you know, is there really need for another barbecue sauce? I know yours is different. But what are the numbers across I guess the nation. I mean, I know people in Kansas City basically pour barbecue sauce in their veins, right. but outside of a barbecue, you know, city, what's the draw? What's the, you know, what's the numbers? Well, you know, I'm seeing that, I, I'm actually seeing just from social media and, and just like, just looking at our, our food culture in general, that barbecue is hot everywhere. Everyone loves barbecue. And Kansas City, I think what really works for us um, is that we have the Kansas City credibility and that we do have the, the all-natural approach because someone in New Jersey, they come out with a barbecue sauce, okay, who's, you know, who's really crazy about New Jersey barbecue? Um, no offense if there's anybody streaming from Jersey, but you know, we're known for it. So I think we have that kind of notch in our belt. And I think that the numbers that show, you know, 30% of people are searching for gluten-free foods, or two-thirds of the food consumers are looking for healthier options, and um, things like that. I think it just, it sort of makes sense. I also write a monthly food trend article uh, uh, that's sort of focused on the Kansas City area for a food research company in the Netherlands, and every, every month it's I, I just read more about you know allergen free and, and autoimmune issues and, and things like that. And so I just know from just being absorbed because this is really my interest and my passion that we're, we're doing the right thing. And so, um, but I don't have like, my, like, stat, like the stats, but I do know, you know, I could probably pull them up if I just did a search, but thank you for that question. Hey, with that in mind, um, over here, Brendan. Oh, yeah. Would you consider licensing your recipes to a major brand? You know, I was asked that question the other day, and I want to say I, I, I'm okay. I want to say also I'm kind of an indecisive person, um, <laughs> but I want to say yes, but I also want to say no. I think it would be cool to get my my whole purpose is to just get healthier food on people's plates. So of course, if Sweet Baby Ray's said, hey, we love this, we want to mass produce this, of course, I would hopefully be able to leverage that somewhere else and, and you know, just stick to the Casey Natural brand. But I, I just want to get as much healthy food on as, as many people's plates as possible. So I would, I would be lying if I said I wouldn't consider it. So. Here in the center. My family has recently switched to a more natural way of eating. The problem is we have allergies. We're one of the 10 to 15% allergic to apples. So when you said apple cider, I said, oh no, we can't do apple cider. So I agree with the guy who said maybe different flavors of the month or something like that, where you would have the natural vinegar back integrated for those who are allergic to that apple. Right, and um, wow, I thought we had everything covered with that paleo sauce. <laughs> but I guess, I guess our next sauce is an apple-free sauce. 
Is there anybody else who has a food allergy to anything I might want to know about so that I can, the next time I do this, I can have sauce for everybody? Thank you for that. I'll start cooking in a few hours. Again, in the center here. All right. Hey, great job. This is my first time I'm a newbie here, so you were the first one. Fantastic. Right. Excellent job. Great. Um, and I'm not sure how many questions I have, but I have a number of items. I've had a number of health issues over the last five years, so I've done paleo, you know, gone gluten-free, done all of that, and it's worked wonders. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're definitely on to the right track here. Um, how about education? Um, are, I didn't, haven't had a chance to look at your website. Are you providing education to people? Because I, I've been tested for celiac, and I'm one of those guys, you know, doctors, I, I don't, I'm not celiac, so then they say that I don't have a problem, but there is a, such a thing as gluten intolerance. Mm -hmm. and, and all of these, um, you know, if you, are you educating people about that? Or do you yeah. have um, rheumatology association, you know, with, the end, with all of that? Are you right. educating them and helping get through that community, basically, to help? Yeah, no, I'm so glad you asked that question because in the 20 minute version of my presentation, uh, I, I uh, would probably talk more about that because that's a huge deal for us. We, we actually have a paleo contributor who writes all about the autoimmune protocol and why it's important. We, education is huge for us and that's also why we go to these wellness events because they keep us in the know of what people are saying, what, how people are feeling. I mean, we talk to people about their personal health stories all the time. And it's really inspiring and it also makes you really have a lot of empathy for people. Um, and it makes you realize that your products are more than just things people pour on ribs. And, and so that's why I think, you know, just hearing you talk about your story, I can relate because I don't have the celiac diagnosis, but I know that once I cut out gluten and started, you know, really paying attention to my health, I lost 50 pounds, yeah. I feel better. Um, anybody that knew me before, I've had to apologize, you know, for the moodiness. I figured it out. Exactly. Um, and so, um, yeah. but no, I completely relate. And I think that's where we are a little different than other brands that just, they want the gluten-free stamp because, oh, they look at the numbers. Well, we talk to the people. We don't just look at the numbers. So. Great. Excellent. Um, and then uh, two questions, uh, two-part question. I noticed that organic is not anywhere in, in there in your marketing, mm -hmm. and natural does not mean organic. And then as far as scaling, have you taken it to competitions against everyone else, the big boys, you know, the barbecue sauce world, and how do they compare? I mean, I'm just, right. as far as scaling and growing your product, eventually, is that right. something you can do and you, something you feel confident uh, yeah. that you'll be able to, you know, right. okay. against uh, those guys? Well, okay, so the second part of your question, um, no, we have, not, we have not really delved into the barbecue competitions and things like that. Um, with, you know, when you're on a shoestring budget, you really have to say, well, where do I spend are these resources? And so uh, product development and attending the wellness events to talk to the people who shape our products. Um, and we, you know, we demo all the time. And so when we get people, we, you know, it, it, you know, I think it does take courage to open a barbecue sauce company in Kansas City. And so, but, but when you go to, to the stores every week and you have people try it and they taste it and they like it, or when they go to that event and they love it, uh, then, you know that, then you know you're doing the right thing. Then that, that to me is as important as any award. Um, although I think it would be fun just to go do some competitions just for the experience of it as well. So, did I miss, what was the first one? Yeah, okay. I would love to do uh, to to shift to organic product lines. Uh, I've, the thing is, you have to have the organic certified facility. Uh, it raises your pro, you know your prices a little bit. I think if we get to the point where we are doing the volume, if we scale to the volume where we can manufacture for you know lower prices and also maybe partner with a facility or another company that has an organic facility, then I would love, I would love to move in that direction. In any way we can just make our products healthier, as I'm, I'm for, I'm, I would not hesitate. Question here in the front. I, I thought it was ironic that Courtney wasn't here for this today, who's like our resident expert on food sensitivity, um, but Thank you for the development of this product, um, and thank you for calling out Original One as well. They've helped a lot of local companies get their yeah. ideas off the ground. Yeah, they're great. Um, so this is a very, very challenging world to be in. 
Mm -hmm. You know, if you've been to McGonagall's and seen the wall of sauces, you know how crowded the space is. Yeah, we're there, so I know, and, believe me. And so you've, you've, you've gotten past the first big hump, which is getting into stores, right? And so what you're probably starting to see now is when you're doing demos, you're getting spikes in sales, but they're waning, right? The challenge is creating sustainable traction and growth. You have to create a brand that people emotionally connect to and are passionate about in order to get them to continually buy so that you're not wasting money on marketing. So from a cost effectiveness perspective, when you're looking at growing this brand, what are your plans to create something that is going to be sustainable where you're gonna have passionate consumers continually buying? Right, well, I think the one, the one thing we're doing right now that is great about being in you know, the social media age, I think 20 years ago, I would just be, you know, it would probably kill me to try to get this sauce in front of a million people. But when you have con uh, people that are so passionate about uh, certain ways of eating, like eating paleo and, and the autoimmune <laughs> protocol, you know, those, those people, if you, can, if you can get it in front of the people that are really the ambassadors for those lifestyles, then you can, it, that can go a long way. Do, I mean, just doing online marketing, which is not expensive. I mean, it's free to start an Instagram account and doing giveaways. And you can also crowdfund. We have plans to do you know, crowdfunding just to get the sauces out into other areas. Uh, we've also, you know, when we've done food shows, like when we went to Chicago, you know, we've talked uh, grocery chains and things like that. I think it can be done. Uh, as a small business, I think you can catch fire. I think it's also going to take luck. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say that I have all the answers in this grand you know, plan that is, you know, doesn't have any holes in it and it's going to be perfect and we're going to... I simply don't know. But what I do know is that I'm just going to do everything I can, including things like this, just to get the word out because I believe it can be done. So, and if, you know, I mean, I hate to even say this, but if it doesn't, you know what? there's always, nothing, nothing's gonna happen to me if this business fails or just like, you know, but I don't think it will, I really don't. I know it won't, but so what? You know, life goes on, it's okay. But I think, uh, I think, I think I'm gonna be fine, so. But I also think I'm gonna need to partner with a lot of smart people and ask a lot of questions and, and also have a lot of luck too, so. Uh, another quick question for you is, uh, tell us a little bit about your, your team. You've mentioned we or us, you know, a couple of times. Yeah. You like the lead chef with a bunch of other chefs in the kitchen? Right, well, or? what I do is I write the recipes. Uh, I have a really extensive background cooking at dive bars and restaurants. So, um, and I've spent a lot of time experimenting uh, in kitchens and cooking sort of my form of meditation. Uh, yeah, when I say we, you know, I have various people who, who help out. I'm the only full-time member. My, like I said, my friend Jason, he was really instrumental in um, just, you know, going to stores, doing demos, working events. Uh, and, you know, in the, over the last couple months, we've, you know, brought in our, a paleo contributor. We've, you know, we have, you know, a couple people who help us with marketing. We have someone who helps us with business strategy a little bit. But it's, you know, it's just kind of like, you know, you just kind of, you know, you meet people along the way and, and they become supportive and you just work out ways to work together. And it's, you know, I think that's, but I think that's good because everyone who's sort of latched on to the Casey Natural brand, it's been, it's been so because, you know, they're passionate about it. It's not because, you know, I'm paying them a million dollars or anything. It's because, you know, they truly, they want to see it successful, so. Hey, Brendan. Over here again, Brendan. I thought, I thought that was you. I was like, Wait, See, they should never give me a mic. Oh, I thought it was me like, too. Yeah, it's like, I haven't seen, <laughs> I was like, yeah, I haven't seen anybody throw their voice just, since I was It's a, a kid. trick I've I learned like, over the years. Whoa. Brendan, over here, the panel. Do me a favor. Okay. Never use the word failure when you re reply, when you respond to your business. You've done more than 99% of the world will ever try. You've already accomplished such great things. All entrepreneurship is, is experimentation. So, you know, continue to experiment, continue to drive forward. You have accomplished so much that it just pained me when you said, if this business fails, there's no way it's going to fail. It's already succeeded. Now, what level of success you have is up to you, but uh, I congratulate you for getting from your kitchen to flipping grocery stores space that's difficult to get and filling a need. So, you know, the, the word failure should not be in your vocabulary. All right. Thank you.
Okay, I'm on. All right, Brendan, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, you have the One Million Cups community here. What can we, as this supportive Kansas City and also just anywhere, what, what, what can we do to support you? What do you, need? you know, I'm, I don't really want to ask anything too specific from anybody. Just buy barbecue sauce. If you have ideas, if you work in the business world or the f food world and you have ideas that might help me you know, get the message out and grow the brand, please just contact me. I'm approachable. Like I said, even if you call the number on the bottle, I'll pick up. It's, so you, please, just if you have any ideas, just let me know. And, and thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, that is our One Million Cups for this week. Thanks so much for coming. We'll be back here again every Wednesday at 9. And um, we'll see you guys around.